Great, thanks. Um, so, get started. Uh, so meditation has a very long history. Um, the scientific study of meditation is uh, something that's relatively more recent. Um, and uh, uh, there was a meta-analysis in 2007 which looked at about a thousand studies. And what they found is that meditative practice does not appear to have a common theoretical framework, uh, or common theoretical perspective. So the, the researchers don't agree about what's supposed to happen in meditation. And so, um, uh, so we have a lot of findings, but we can't really integrate them or draw, uh, draw much conclusion from them. And um, this has kind of been the, the state of the, the field for a long time. Uh, Del Monte, uh, 1987, complained about it, and um, then there hasn't been much progress. And again, in, in uh, 2009, um, it's pretty much the same situation. So, I mean, I, uh, I like what Carrington said about meditation. She said, uh, meditation is when the mind is alert with having any object of awareness, uh, but there's lots of other opinions. So uh, I suggest that um, some recent results in neuroscience might help us to converge upon uh, a definition of meditation that we can all agree agree about. Um, so Arnie Dietrich, uh, he looked at neuroscience evidence on dreaming, uh, altered states of consciousness like dreaming, endurance running, meditation, daydreaming, hypnosis drug-induced states, and flow. And um, he suggested that all of these altered states are caused by what he calls a transient prefrontal uh, cortex deregulation. And so, so I'm going to describe what that means. Uh, it's kind of uh, a lot. But, uh, I have to review a little neuroscience in a few slides. But... First, I wanted to uh, thank my collaborators. And um, <clears throat> so, okay, and the, the other thing is, why am I presenting this talk here, like in you know, quantitative methods, part of psychology? You know, what do you guys know about neuroscience and spirituality and meditation? I mean, why is this the right venue? So, <clears throat> what I learned in my psych methods course. Uh, uh, here at UVA is that um, theories become stronger by being challenged. So it's, it's important to try to falsify theories and by trying to falsify them we learn something and, and the theories become stronger. They either fail, they come up with a new theory, or um, the, the, we, we learn the boundaries, the boundary conditions of the theory. Uh, so <coughs> um, it's, it's been kind of a challenge working with the Religious Studies Department. I tried to uh, even announce this talk on their mailing list, and uh, I, I, I got pushed back from them. They, they like, didn't even want to announce it, didn't even want to tell their graduate students that it's happening. So, um, uh, and, and it's not just like a, a policy like that they don't send certain kinds of email to their grad students. Um, they, I've actually had the experience that, that certain people in religious studies don't even like my hypotheses and they, they don't want to test them. So this, this is like, to me, this, like, if you don't want to test hypotheses, this, this is like disgraceful and unscientific. I mean, I hate to use those words, but um, to, to, to do science, we need to be willing to, uh, we need to have the courage to to subject our theories to empirical testing and scrutiny. Can I have that in written, please? <laughs> that? I want this in written. On top of it. It's being recorded. Um, all right. So back to uh, altered states of consciousness. Um, so we need to review a few things about how the brain works. So our everyday awareness is assembled from a variety of brain modules, and these modules can be organized into a functional hierarchy in terms of degree of refinement 
from raw sensory input to ex explicit conceptual thought and executive function. So the, the basic core of consciousness is in, enabled by the, the brain stem. Um, that's here. And the thalamus probably manages the integration of immediate sensory information and information de derived from other processing modules. Uh, and the limbic system orchestrates memory consolidation, basic emotions, relational learning, and emotional memory. The limbic system is kind of um, everything that's not the neocortex. So this is the limbic system is the old part of our brain um, that uh, you know lots of mammals have. And the neocortex is is um, uh, when we humans have the largest neocortex. So that, that's the newer part. Um, so, for example, with practice, the limbic system can handle most of the mechanics of driving a car, leaving your ne neocortex free to uh, listen to the radio or chat with a passenger. So the, the limbic system is extremely, extremely efficient, but it, it's uh, non-conceptual. It just, just kind of works automatically. And um, the way you remember works differently in the two systems, too. Uh, if you've internalized a phone number, like you've stored it in your limbic system, then you may not be able to retrieve it except by just like punching numbers in the air or like a, with like ATM codes, right? You, you, you can't remember them, but you can punch them. Um, so that, that's because you're retrieving them from your limbic system. Let's see. So uh, to continue on, the, uh, the cortical level deals with perception, explicit memory, attention, complex emotions, and self-construct. And cortex supports the uh, explicit knowledge system. And, and kind of the, the most refined um, computations occur in this area. This is the uh, prefrontal cortex. And um, the functions there include working memory, temporal integration, and focused attention. In addition, the dorsolateral region performs abstract thinking, self-reflection, theory of mind, and generally enables cognitive flexibility. Right. So what is our subjective experience uh, using our brain? Well, uh, it depends. So these are two people eating a chocolate bar, and but they, their subjective experience is completely different. Right. Um, so <clears throat> since, let's see, so altered states of, in altered states of consciousness, such as uh, meditation or, or um, uh, optimal, ex optimal experience, so there's, there's like a partial deactivation of the neocortex, and subjectively this results in the, uh, like a, uh, they call it a phenomenological subtraction. So the idea is that um, if you are some part of your brain shuts down, then um, you lose access to those computations, and you simply function on the next highest layer that remains. So if you if you lose your brainstem, then you know that's pretty much game over, and you're in a coma. But if you're, um, um, if something goes wrong with your prefrontal cortex, then you, you can function pretty well, but some things are missing. Um, I don't know, Antonio Damasio has a nice book on this uh, with lots of examples. Uh, uh, Descartes Scare, yes. So, it's the title. All right, so. Right, phenomenological subtraction. Right, so how does this work in meditation? Uh, so now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quote Dietrich because um, I'm inviting you to agree with a definition of meditation that he is advancing. He has proposed that meditation results in transient hypofrontality with the notable exception of the attentional network in the prefrontal cortex 
The resulting conscious state is one of full alertness and a heightened sense of awareness, but without content. So phenomenologically, meditators report a state that is consistent with decreased frontal function, such as a sense of timelessness, denial of self, little if any self-reflection and analysis, little emotional content, little abstract thinking, no planning, and a sense of unity. Right, so that, that's his uh, proposal. Um, now I also want to uh, discuss flow, which is, um, so, so what is flow? Flow is when you're, uh, when you're engaged in a, in a challenging activity and um, so like, uh, so explicit processing is reduced, implicit processing is increased. Um, let's see, okay, so flow state is a period during which a highly practiced skill that is re represented in the implicit system's knowledge base is implemented without interference from the explicit system it is proposed that a necessary prerequisite to the experience of flow is a state of transient hypofrontality that it enables the temporary suppression of the analytical and metaconscious capacities of the explicit system. So again, I was quoting from Dietrich there. Um, so I'm going to give more examples of flow. So, uh, but that, that's kind of a high-level description. So the the how of meditation is a little mysterious. Uh, the lab manual of our University of Virginia Religious Studies course on meditation is about 40 pages with chapters like a beginner's mind, full body breathing, and active visualization. Uh, in contrast for flow, a neurologically similar state, there are succinct clear-cut recommendations for, for how to generate the experience of flow. Um, for example, these, uh, these base jumpers are either going to experience prefrontal hypofunction or they are going to be paralyzed with fear. Uh, so now we're going to proceed to the uh, first-hand experience part of my lecture. Um, did these windows open? Or? No. no. Okay, well, we'll, just, we'll skip that. Uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe next time I give the lecture. <laughs> All right, so specifically, how do people get into flow? All right, so um, flow is, is, uh, is, is related to challenge and ability. So um, on, on the y-axis here is the amount of challenge in the activity you're engaged in. And um, you, won't, you won't find flow in low challenge activities. You need high challenge activities. but uh, uh, here on the x-axis is your your skill or ability to meet these challenges. So uh, if you have poor skill to, or poor ability to meet these challenges, you won't find flow either. You, uh, this is like a high challenge activity that you, you aren't very good at. Suppose um, I want to go hang gliding. You know, that's not going to work really well. Uh, <clears throat> so I would have a lot of anxiety uh, because I don't have any... Uh, practice with hang gliding, uh, but if I did, um, and it was a challenging activity, then then I might get into flow. So uh, challenge and, challenge and ability uh, challenge of the activity is important in the ability you bring to it, and um, uh, Sen Mihal Mihali, uh, he was one of the the main researchers who worked on flow originally also uh, identified the need for clear goals and immediate feedback. Okay, but so th those are that's kind of the uh, the original research. But um, one one of uh, Chiksent Mihaly's graduate students, Keith Sawyer, has uh, taken this a bit further and looked at social flow triggers. So social flow is something that happens. Um, with jazz musicians or you know, sometimes with 
uh, in, in uh, sports like basketball where a group of people all kind of uh, get into flow together. And um, so uh, Keith Sawyer identified a bunch of uh, uh, triggers for uh, the social flow, um, and some of them are similar to uh, the, the original conditions, the four conditions, challenge, uh, skill, and so forth, but there are some differences. So um, I'll just, I'm not going to go into all of them, but uh, I just want to um, give, give you a little more information about some of them. So um, equal participation means that there shouldn't be too much difference between skill levels. For example, uh, a jazz group consisting of two expert musicians and one novice probably aren't going to get into much flow unless uh, bringing a novice up to speed is, is part of the group goal. And for familiarity, um, by working together, people develop tacit knowledge about each other. Some degree of familiarity is helpful, but too much can lead to stagnation. So it's like you need a balance in familiarity. And for uh, sense of control, um, there's also a balancing act because individual members need to feel in control while at the same time be willing to defer to the emergent trajectory of the group. Um, so uh, and then close listening uh, refers to uh, attending moment by moment, whereas um, this other, so close, these are pretty similar, good communication and close listening. So good communication is more about uh, staying in touch with the big picture and avoid drifting too far from the goals of the group. Um, and always say yes is, is kind of an individual faith that there is a marvelous solution out there and then also the fortitude to keep exploring new ideas. So hopefully that that gives you kind of a flavor of what social flow is involves and, and how to get into it. Right, so we have uh, quite a list of very specific triggers for uh, making it more likely that you'll experience the flow state. Right. So now I wanted to, let's see, oh, so uh, this recent paper in 2004 uh, observed, as I did, that uh, Arne Dietrich's descriptions of flow and meditation are, are very similar. And um, in fact, there are uh, both uh, phenomenologically and neurologically, uh, there's, there are these commonalities. So, um, so phenomenologically, the explicit system is not permitted to run amok, but allows the implicit system to take over to some extent, and there's less multitasking. So, the the multitasking example I gave before about you know you're driving a car and your implicit system does most of the steering and shifting while you can talk to a passenger well. That's not going to happen because you're fully engaged in whatever task you're you're involved with. Um, and then neurologically, uh, the paralleling so that that's that's the subjective experience. But um, we should also see neurologically that there's increased limbic and decreased uh, cortical activation and increased synchronization across brain regions. So your brain isn't kind of doing two different things, but it's it's integrated in how it's processing. All right, so who cares? Why is this important? Well, uh, both meditation and flow developed without the benefit of these results from neuroscience. And Western researchers have struggled to separate essential and non-essential facets of contemplative practices. That's kind of where I started People don't agree about what a meditation is, what you're supposed to do when, when, uh, when you're practicing meditation, what's the, what the result is supposed to be. For example, uh, uh, mindfulness, uh, I believe it was developed by 
Jon Kabat-Zinn, uh, was the result of secularizing traditional Buddhist practice. So he decided, well, you know, you probably don't have to, uh, uh, you know, give away all your possessions and and wear a single garment and, and shave your head. Um, you know, those those parts of uh, Buddhist practice are not important. And what's important is the mindfulness part, right? So he made he made a uh, uh, an informed judgment, and that that's how we have a, a secular idea of mindfulness now. Yeah. Um, so another example is there's there's a persistent line of research that has examined whether uh, meditation um, reduces physiological arousal faster or mi- more efficiently than simple rest. You know, people have said meditation is good because it makes you feel relaxed, right? But uh, so, the, but, but that's that's saying that, that relaxation is the essential part, and the other part is not essential, right? So, the, it's making a judgment there. Um, so, so this neuroscience evidence allows us to propose the specific hypothesis that uh, the ties that's the uh, transient. Implicit explicit synchronization that, that uh, we see in both of these experiences is the essential part and the rest is non essential. So that's what I'm inviting you to agree with. All right, so I wanted to investigate ties um, and I don't want to try to study meditation or flow anymore. That's, that's, there's too much historical baggage. Um, I just want to study ties now. So we could start, of course, uh, flow. We could find ties in flow or, or through meditation. So meditation seemed easier to me, so that, that's where uh, I decided to start. Of course, the I didn't want to study meditation the old way. So... Uh, so the old way is we don't know what meditation is. We don't know if that cat is doing meditation now. Uh, with this model, we can, I mean, we can examine if, if something, you know, meditation uh, is correlated with, with these benefits, but um, it's, hard to, it's hard to really understand the mechanism. Uh, so, I propose a new model, and this model should give us a lot more power to de- de- detect effects compared to the old model. For example, some participants who practice meditation uh, experience ties. However, some participants who claim to meditate may not be experiencing ties at all. So, the old model would just average all those people together because they say they're doing meditation, right? But with the new model, Hopefully we we can find independent measures of ties, so then we can uh, separate out the people who are actually experiencing ties from those who are just doing contemplative practices, and we should have a lot more power to detect effects. Um, the other thing to notice about this model is it's a uh, we can we can test statistically whether. Uh, there's a direct effect from these contemplative practices or flow triggers to uh, the outcome measures, or whether uh, there's, or whether it's mediated by ties. So, you know, let's let's uh, subject it to empirical scrutiny. All right. So we need to measure uh, each of these. Uh, three latent constructs as precisely as we can. Um, I'm going to start with uh, ties, trying to measure ties, uh, describe how I'm working on it. Um, all right, so I'm going to I'm going to come back to all these things so you don't have to remember it. Uh, let's see. I guess the main one I want to talk about here is. Um, so there's uh, 
in, in, in split brain patients, there's uh, lots of, um, there's been a lot of work with split brain patients because what they find is that uh, there's, uh, in, the, in the left orbitofrontal cortex, there's this function in our brain which, which generates causal theories. And um, certainly if, if we're experiencing mental silence, then we're not generating causal theories. So, uh, I mean, mental silence probably rules out a lot more than causal theorizing, but um, so the, the uh, so this this is this chart isn't is uh, trying to get at what what kind of phenomenon are subtracted from our subjective experience. That that's so uh, that's how I propose to measure ties. Is we should see a phenomenological subtraction. So when when we experience mental silence, that's the same as saying, well, we don't have uh, we don't we aren't generating causal theories. Um, in fact, we probably aren't. Um, there's probably a lot of thinking that isn't isn't going on. So, so the same same thing goes on. Uh, same idea for these other rows. So, uh, distinguishing self from other. There's some evidence that that's, uh, that computation is done by a right her, her, parietal lobe. Uh, so, if that if that process like shuts down, then we should experience a sense of oneness. Uh, for conscious will, um, there's some evidence. Well, it's not very well localized, but yeah, in, in the cortex. And I, I'm going to talk about uh, spontaneity later. So that, that's that's kind of tricky to describe. Uh, duration accounting that that's pretty simple. So um, I'm talking about um, you know how long was that class, or how long did it take you to eat lunch? Well, you know, probably 10 minutes or 15 minutes, that kind of thing. That kind of gross duration accounting, not, I'm not talking about uh, sub-seconds or anything. Um, and uh, it's, it's, I don't, uh, from what I read, it's not very well localized, but it's mainly computed by the, the neocortex. And uh, if you don't have duration accounting, then we should experience a sense of timelessness. All right, so so these are these are the um, right here the, the, the three latent uh, constructs that I that I want to measure, and um, these are some candidate ways of measuring them. Uh, so I'm going to talk about talk about these first. This is kind of where I started. All right, so this is cross-sectional data. So um, it looks like a great correlation, but who knows what's going to happen when we when we try to look at it longitudinally. Um, uh, yeah, so a barrier item. So that there's this latent barrier factor that I'm hypothesizing. And uh, two items from that. Are I'm afraid of what will happen if I stop thinking, and it takes too much effort for me to experience complete mental silence. Uh, for training, um, during the last 30 days, how often did you allocate time to experience or try to experience complete mental silence? Um, and how many people have you met who are convincingly familiar with complete mental silence? Uh, so those are, those are just some sample items for training. And sample items for mental silence. I allow myself to experience complete mental silence. Just ask them. And uh, during structured sessions, approximately how long did your longest experience of complete mental silence last? Of course, if they're experiencing timelessness, then it may be hard for, them, hard for them to estimate. But maybe we can get some kind of some kind of data from that. Uh, so this this has a, a great R squared of of point forty three, but again, uh, this is just cross sectional. So 
may not hold up. Um, all right, so I've collected uh, more cross-sectional data um, from our human subjects pool here in psychology. And the way to read this chart is that this is positive effect from the PANAS. So, uh, let's see, positive effect. Well, the cor correlations with positive effect. Of course, um, PANAS, PANAS item, items are interested, excited, strong, words like that. Uh, these, the data are zero inflated because, of course, undergraduates don't experience mental silence very often. So. Um, so if you include all the participants, then you see correlations of zero. But what you can do is you can uh, pick a minimum uh, tie score and exclude everybody that has a lower score than that. So, um, so minus 1.5, uh, the, the, uh, if, if we look at this point on the x-axis, then uh, everybody who had a score that was lower than negative 1.5, basically everybody who doesn't experience mental silence or, or doesn't experience it very much, then we do see a uh, significant positive correlation in cross-sectional data um, for, for ties, but not for training. Yes, so, okay, so the dashed line Okay, what's the dashed line? Okay, so the, sh the shaded areas, the, the, the blue one is ties, uh, a 95% confidence interval of the correlation, and the pink one is uh, training, a 95% confidence interval, and then the, the dashed line is, um, uh, not flow, but uh, ties minus training. It's supposed to be ties. Um, so, if the dashed line is above zero, then positive effect is more associated with uh, ties than it is with training. This, the x-axis is the excluded, yes, so negative 1.5 means everyone who's below negative 1.5 has been excluded, everyone above is included in this data. Mm -hmm. That's right. Cross-sectional. Right. Uh, so, so that's uh, Hannah's positive effect. Um, let's also look at some self-actualization measures. There's uh, previous research has suggested that people who meditate are more self-actualized. So, uh, and that's what I found cross-sectionally. So th this is a you can see kind of the same pattern in these plots, where um, the uh, if, if we go to x-axis of minus 1, then environmental mastery is, there's a statistically significant correlation. So, okay, so what is, what is environmental mastery? Let me give you some example items. In general, I feel I am in charge of the situation in which I live. I am quite good at managing the many responsibilities of my daily life. And, uh, and here's autonomy. Um, this is also a uh, statistically significant correlation. I have great confidence in my opinions, even if they are contrary to the general consensus. And I judge myself by what I think is important, not by the values of what other think, others think is important. Those are autonomy example items. So this, these are all the same kind of plot, just with different outcome measures. So these, um, these are good candidates for exploring longitudinally. And I'm, I'm currently collecting data for environmental mastery. Um, we'll have something to report soon. All right, so I just wanted to go over a few more 
uh, things that I'd, I'd like to do in the future. So for a sense of oneness, um, that, that would probably just be a single item uh, like this. During the session, to what extent were you aware of your physical location? Well, I was sitting in the room and that's how I felt. Um, or I lost track of the boundaries of my physical body. I felt a sense of oneness with the whole. Uh, a sense of oneness was profound and persisted for a few hours after the session. So that's, that's the kind of item I'm considering adding uh, in a future study. Um, and let's look at timelessness. Um, time, uh, timelessness is kind of hard to ask about, uh, but maybe a, an item geared for real, you know, beginners in meditation might might give you uh, might provide good data, so that it's not too noisy. So just during a, during recent sessions, I think about how much time is remaining in the session. You know. If you're constantly looking at your watch, then it's not gonna, you're not going to experience ties very much. Right. So I, I promised to talk about spontaneity a bit more. Now, um, this this is really a, a central thing in in Zen Buddhism and and even going as far back as Karma Yoga. Uh, so. So I'm going to make an audacious claim here, and um, well, okay. Before I do that, uh, so so if you if you ask Zen Buddhists to define what do they mean exactly by not doing, right? Um, you know, they 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 claim that they know what what that means, like to to not do something or to to act without doing or something like that, uh, but. But if you if you try to pin them down and ask them, okay, what does this really mean? Then, then they might hit you with a stick, or I mean, it's it's very uh, you don't you really don't get a very good definition from them, or at least I haven't read one. And then the student was enlightened. Uh, yeah, exactly. So I'm, I'm still trying to to get enlightened. I've, I've been hit many times, but somehow still. Going around and around on this, so um, so I'm going to make an audacious claim here, and I'm going to say that that here's a specific way of defining what it means to to do without doing or something like that, and this goes back to karma yoga. Like Patanjali also talked about this, and um, and this this is uh, this table is from Wenger's Wenger's book. Wenger was a social social psychologist who who uh, who taught here at UVA for some time, a few years ago, until he passed away. Um, okay, so what, how does this chart work? Uh, so when you're doing something and you feel like you're doing it, then that's normal voluntary action, right? Everyone is familiar with that. Nothing special. So if, and if you're not doing something and you don't feel like you're doing something, well, that's normal in action. Well, you know, nothing special again. The tricky part comes in the uh, the other cells in the table. So suppose you feel like you're doing something, but you're actually not doing it. So what's an example of that? Well, I bet you've all had that feeling before, uh, or or even even had this this example has happened to you before. Uh, suppose you're you're playing a video game and you're really involved in controlling the character, right? And then you realize it's in demo mode. <laughs> right, so that's that's the feeling of doing, but uh, you're not actually doing something. And and then, okay, the feeling. Uh, uh, let's see. Wait. So then, okay, right. So then, the feeling of doing. Or, no, I'm getting confused. So you now, the, the last cell on the table is where you're doing something, but you don't feel that you're doing it. So, so that's that's the important one here. That's what I think that all these uh, Zen Buddhists are talking about. Now, <clears throat> now this this comes up 
uh, in other contexts too, like um, in the stories of Jekyll and Hyde, uh, where we have the same person who's like a normal professor, and then you know he loses control and he does uh, strange things. Um, or, or maybe in Alien Hand Syndrome, where there's, there's actually a, some, something goes wrong neurologically and, and you can't control your hand. Uh, so, so those kind of cases also appear in this cell, where you're, where you're doing something, but you don't feel like you're doing it. <clears throat> but here we're interested in something more like the experience of an artist when feeling guided by higher forces to produce a masterpiece, something like that. So, um, so this, this has also been called uh, automatism, but um, for, the, for, the kind of, for the kind of things we'd like to talk about, I think spont spontaneity is a better description. So, so there's, there's actually a study, uh, I think it's, it was done by one of Wenger's graduate students, uh, it showed that you can you can prime people to move from from this cell to this cell in the lab, and um, it was done in 2008. And there's about 115 citations, uh, but I think we we could do. I mean, it was it was a pretty small sample size, and uh, you know we, could, we should probably do a lot more studies on this because I mean this this is. This is really important. This is about uh, kind of the core idea of, of Zen Buddhism or, or Karma Yoga here. So um, psychology has really been kind of, uh, well, uh, we could use more studies on this, I think. And um, see, to, to give you kind of an idea of, of how this prime works is, uh, uh, in, at least in India, um, w one of the ways people people do this, they just uh, try to move from from here to here. Is they they say like they recite to themselves like, uh, "Mother is the doer; I am just an instrument of her will," or, or "Or God is the doer; I'm just an instrument of His will." That kind of thing. And, and um, by just kind of repeating that to yourself, uh, they may be able, they may be able to move themselves from from when they're doing something to feel like they're doing it to feel like uh, they're 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 not doing what they're doing, and that they're being controlled by like higher forces. So, so that could be really important. Um, yeah. So that that's uh, I know we can talk about that again later, but I guess that's all I want to say about it for now. All right. So that was. Um, so I'm not sure how to ask about. Uh, so th this would be spontaneity. Spontaneity would be one of the measures of ties, um, but I'm not sure how to ask people about it. Like, you know, uh, during the day, how often do you do something and feel like you're not doing it? Like, um, I'm not sure how many people are going to understand that. <laughs> So some some kind of like basic research is needed to, to understand how to ask people about this. Uh, let's see. So oh, okay. So I, I'm just going to keep going here. There's a few more uh, uh, ways that um, I think we can measure these latent constructs. Um, again, again, citing Dietrich. Um, Attentional resources are used to actively amplify a particular event, like when when you're engaged in, in flow or meditation. So, you know, which 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 um, how how you're directing your attention does does it matter um, during the session? Where's where's the most important for you to focus your attention? It it might uh, it might make a difference. Maybe. Okay, one question about that. Mm -hmm. So I thought that his earlier definition of meditation said it was without content. Um, mm -hmm. Isn't this content? Yeah. So um, this actually with he 
in his definition, in his, uh, uh, the way he defined it, uh, attention was the exception. So, meditation results in, in transient hypofrontality with a notable exception of the attentional network in the prefrontal cortex. So, the idea is you're using your attention to block out everything else. So you're, you're narrowly focusing your attention on whatever. I'm, I'm not sure. What, I don't know what, what's the best object of attention uh, to, to kind of get this process started. Um, if, if you ask the religious studies department, they could you know, give you a, a big list of, of things to try. I'm sure. So, so yeah, that, that's what this would be asking about. And then I also want to um, add in here social flow triggers. So uh, many people construe their meditative practice as a solo art. Can we recruit social flow triggers to support meditation? Uh, in some Buddhist and Hindu traditions, spiritual progress is thought to be bolstered by adopting a celibate life without possessions. And the Catholic Church has sometimes imposed obligatory clerical celibacy. Um, so, uh, to take a step back here, I'm, I'm mostly interested in meditation, but this, the, the question of family also comes up in flow. Uh, so, S Steve, Steve Kotler wrote, wrote a book on flow recently, and, and um, one of the things he wrote is, what, what about the lacrosse star you know, who really enjoyed lacrosse, who graduates into a job as, as an accountant, much needed to feed her family, right? Or the mother of three who used to do some sculptures, and you know, she, was, she loved sculpturing uh, when she was younger, but now has no time for herself, right? So, so family is, is, is it an obstacle? I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a question that comes in, in, in flow as well as in, in, from meditation perspective. All right, so Sri Mataji is, uh, is a photo of Sri Mataji. She was a contemporary spiritual teacher and passed away in 2011. And in, in addition to the usual contemplative practices, she proposed the intensive study and expression of the maternal nurturing side of our personality. So th this is similar to the Buddhist concept of Sangha, but she elaborated and expanded on it in hundreds of lectures. Her lectures included many ideas for the uh, husband-wife relationship, parent-child relationship, brother-sister relationship, uh, grandparent-grandchild relationship. In addition, she advocated an expanded circle of relationships beyond the immediate family. And um, Sri Mataji, that, that name she picked means the mother. And um, so I suggest this maternal theme can be construed as a structured practice aimed at facilitating ties via group flow. So, something to pursue. Um, uh, I, I talked, I emailed Keith Sawyer if he had any ideas about measures of group flow, and um, he said that I probably have to develop something. There wasn't a lot, a lot of uh, measures that had already been developed for group flow, so it's a long-term project. So th this is kind of like a uh, timeline uh, of uh, this research program. So I, I hope to have, um, I'm collecting data now. I hope to have it analyzed in a few months, and then um, then there's some simple items that you know, I can probably add in the, the next time I collect data, and then long term um, I'd like to, to try to figure out how to add these more difficult measures, more challenging measures, and to try to measure these latent constructs as accurately as possible. So, yeah, so any questions? <laughs>
one of your later slides. I had lots of questions, but I wanted to start on this one because it might be the most reasonable question to ask, which is the the four, two by two table where you talked about doing or feeling of doing and not feeling of doing and spontaneity. There yeah. you go back there. Yeah. yeah. So I'm going to oversimplify this, and then you can say that's just limited. But you know, when I think about no feeling of doing but doing, I think of activities that, you know, like when we talk about driving a car or riding a bike, I don't think about it at all. And sometimes if it's not a rigorous or vigorous activity, you really don't notice you're doing it. All of a sudden you might go from one place to another. Would you call that a spontaneous activity? Or that's really just the wrong domain. Um, yeah. Um... So uh, you're asking if, if some activity that's not uh, all enveloping uh, could be considered spontaneous, right? And I think it, I think it is. Um, it's just that it's not all enveloping. So, uh, so it's just, yeah, your implicit system is doing something automatically, like it does all the time. And uh, so, I, but, but I think the... The difference between that and meditation or flow is that with, with meditation or flow, you're 100% engaged in what you're doing. So, like, you're fully doing something and fully not feeling like you're doing it. I must just be mad at that in meditation because it's more like focus on sound, focus on one thing, intrusive thought, squat, intrusive thought. And so if you look at that graph, it's not 100%. Maybe if you're really good at it. But I feel like for most people, it's a lot more kind of, it's like inhibitory, inhibitory, inhibitory. Um, but also, this thing, it kind of reminds me of, if you're trying to get at spontaneity things, like someone like suddenly being inspired and like they're a painter, they feel like the physical action of moving their hands, but it's more about like that higher order of control in terms of like stopping. They're like, no, I can't stop. Like, you know, that higher order of control is going to maybe not necessarily, like, no feeling of doing. Does that make sense? I feel like no feeling of doing is a label that kind of doesn't get at what you're actually... Like, if an artist okay. is, they feel their hand gripping the paintbrush. They feel moving. It's not no feeling of doing. It's, like, no feeling of higher order control over doing kind of thing. And I don't know if that's helpful or not, but I just... Um, yeah, uh, I'm not I'm not sure how to like restate your question accurately, but um, but I agree that, that more research on this needs to be done, and uh, I think it it could be a very fruitful direction for research because it's such a uh, historically it's it's such an important kind of distinction. So yes. So so um, what about uh, the example of no feeling of doing and doing uh, being sleepwalking. Right. Uh, Is that like an extreme example of that? Or I'm not sure. Because people will like wake up somewhere else. Or yes, dreaming you're going to the bathroom walked. or something, yeah, right? Yeah. 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 Hopefully happen? not. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's never happened to any of us, right? <laughs> Um, yeah, so sleepwalking is a good example. Um, uh, Arnie Dietrich has like a textbook on altered states of consciousness that I went through, and I, I remember he touched on this. And uh, I, I think the the difference between, I mean, the, when you're sleepwalking, there are certain parts of your brain that are that are shut down, that um, you know, that that are not shut down when you're awake. Uh, so it, it does seem like it, it fits this, but it's it's also not. Um, I mean, it's distinct from flow and meditation. It's, I mean, there's there's a different a brain brain pattern of which which uh, regions would be active during that. But but yeah, it's, it certainly fits. In, so in that so field. is there a notion of intentionality that you're trying to get at? Is it intentional spontaneity? Mm. 
That's a good question. Intentional spontaneity. Um, but I don't you know can't if you be can... conscious of it, right? Can you not be conscious of that intentionality? <laughs> I don't know if you can intend to be spontaneous. Maybe you can be. I'm not sure. After I hit you with the stick, maybe you can do it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's try that. <laughs> All right, what are you guys doing to me? <laughs> Yeah, New Year's resolutions to be spontaneous. I mean, it's perfectly reasonable. Some people are like, I want to do things more like, when I think about it, I'm just going to do it. And that's something we typically define as spontaneity. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not necessarily no feeling in that sense. Well, well what, about, what about a jazz uh, improvisation? Mm -hmm. um, you know, they're going through the chords, and you're with the band, and then the band sort of like pushes you up onto this uh, time for you to be spontaneous and as a as a improvisational musician you have to grab that moment and be spontaneous right then you have to intend to be spontaneous and it is it is a trick you really have to step outside yourself to do it it's very interesting yeah um in, in, Weng, in his book, Wenger, uh, he talks about, um, not so many, but he talks about a few ways to, to move from, from, from this cell to this cell, from normal voluntary action to spontaneity. Uh, and you know, and I, I also mentioned that example in India, like where you, uh, many people uh, pray or, or, or tell themselves, you know, that I'm, I'm controlled by uh, God and uh, I'm not. I'm not doing this. I'm just an instrument of God. So, so yeah. There, there are ways to to. There are interventions to move from here to here. But it's to call them intentional is maybe clouding the issue. Like, I don't know. It's well, I'm trying to separate it from from sleepwalking. Yeah. Which is or or you know people describe. Oh, I don't know. They had some fear reaction. A spider or snake or something, and then they suddenly found themselves on top of a chair or something. Yeah, and it was like, well, how did that happen? <laughs> right. Um, and yeah, their body was going ahead and just taking care of business, <laughs> and, but <laughs> their their mind was not on the taking care of part. <laughs> but that was not intended. Um, mm. oh, okay, I see what you're saying. So, what the opposite for the cell? So, if I, um, you know, if I. Can't stop myself from telling, say, saying something that I didn't want to say. <laughs> I see someone who looks ill, and I say, "Oh, you look bad today." I, I mean to say, you know, <laughs> and this, this is, does it fall into the cells? So if I do something because I cannot stop myself from, you know, it's not voluntary. I mean, or or it's not a normal voluntary action, right? Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. Kind of the opposite. Even, right. Yeah. Um, Unplanned doing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh. One could loss, phrase loss of innovation. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One could phrase it as I, I was uh, intending to do it on uh, not enough thinking, and while you know I couldn't stop myself from doing it, when my brain pro processed that there are good point the reasons why I should not do it. Mm. Yeah. Tourette's, said, Tourette's syndrome. Yeah. Would be a place to. Oh, yeah. That's an extreme case. Yeah. Exactly. Mm. Seems like in a lot of the research, the definitions are just kind of very wide, very like flow. Mm -hmm. But then in in the cell, then then that would create some questions you could ask automatically. Mm -hmm. This happens to I, I don't know you, but it happens to me at least twice a day or something. <laughs> I could if someone asked me a good questionnaire, how often did you yesterday? Um, do something. There's a blurt what, scale. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> are you a blurter or not? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. So. Also, um, oh, sorry. You go ahead. Uh, I was wondering for this and for other things, um, how we could methodologically avoid that uh, we get the confound of getting aware of this. So in, in yeah. this cell, um, 
you know, and if I had more experience, and I have more experience of saying stupid things, I'm also more experienced of saying something right afterwards, which makes it sound like it's not so bad. <laughs> um, <laughs> more experienced in covering up, right? Right, yeah. and I, and I probably am more aware of it than, um, you know, people who are typically very aware of what they're doing at this moment, are less confused uh, than I am from time to time. Um, and it's the same holds for other things too. So if I am in this, um, if I do mediation a lot, and I've got this, um, uh, maybe I've got a very good um, grasp of this, um, not you know, of this oneness thing, then that also uh, influences how I perceive it. I can perceive it, maybe it's being more there or or less, depending on the direction. So. Um, and I see a trend here, a systematic change, that the more experienced you are in, in something and the more you have it, the measurement of it, or separating at least, may actually go down again. For self report Yes. Not that I've got an answer. <laughs> yeah, I mean, how, does, how does this fit in with self-monitoring? Self monitoring. How does this fit in with self monitoring? From what you two. Uh -huh. yeah, I was thinking of self monitoring too. So is self monitoring feeling of doing and and then controlling the action? I'm tempted to say yes. But there may be a counterexample. <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if there's a right answer. It's just, you know, throwing questions out. Excellent. There, um, fairly recently, developments in neuroscience, they can knock out areas of the brain. Um, yeah. And, like, with just not invasively. They're yeah. not, like, sticking a deep needle yeah. deep down into yeah. your cortex or anything. Mm -hmm. um, and so that would be really interesting as they continue to, like, localize on areas of the brain that are implicated in meditation and flow, if they can knock out all the things around your attentional system, attentional system in here, can you just kind of instantly put someone into, like, flow? Um, can you, you know, kind of seeing, like, which aspects of, I guess you're looking at all of these, like, self-report style, but which aspects of these kind of show up and don't show up when certain brain regions are knocked out. So someone will probably pick up the torch in that end. And yeah. Um in, in terms of using, um, it's called transcranial magnetic stimulation. Mm -hmm. And um, in terms of using uh, uh, TMS to explore these kinds of issues, I'm, I'm aware of at least one study where they, they did uh, do that um, kind of thing to knock out the neocortex. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, people were able to do creative problem solving much more quickly. Um, and, it, and it was pretty the big. The whole neocortex? Or, Part of it, I, I don't know exactly, uh, and they were they were people were able to do problem solving much more, and I think it was like a huge effect size too. So, but I don't know that much about the study. I remember reading about it. It's funny. Yeah. I I don't know. I mean, um, tr transcranial magnetic stimulation. It, it's probably not. It's probably just temporary, right? But yeah. but. We don't really know, so um, yeah, I'm, I'm a little hesitant about um, signing up myself for that. I also think that they, uh, so I was a bio double major with psych, but then I ended up dropping it to be a minor. Um, I think that they only do it on regions in humans where they've repeatedly seen that you can actually bring it back to full, to, to full efficacy afterwards. So yeah, we don't want to go knock out like the brain stone or something. <laughs> Because that would be really bad if you didn't come back. Um, so, you're probably going to keep improving that and hopefully that can contribute some to the knowledge on these um, individual aspects of, I guess, meditation and flow. Mm -hmm. I do have a question about the graphs. Um, I, I um, didn't, I don't think I understand. Um, so, okay. There's, here's the graph. Now, as I, um, as I sweep along from left to right, is this cumulative? Um, or is each slice within the 
you know, or is each, each slice independent? Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, um, right, so you're asking if, if the, uh, so which participants are in each slice? So um, exactly. these, these participants um, that are included here are in all of, it, all of them. And, and so, so, uh, so it's cumulative from this side, basically. So that so someone who has very high, um, very high experience, reported experience of mental silence, they're going to be included in all of the uh, correlations. But someone, someone with a little bit lower, um, they'll just be included in all of these, but excluded from these. Um, right, so we don't have enough data to extend it further. Um, the, the sample size is so low here, it just gets erratic. Okay. So does that mean most people are saying, or not a whole lot of people are saying they've experienced? Yeah, but I mean, it's UVA participant pool students, so. Yeah. And is there uh, a statistical technique uh, we can find out whether the whole thing is significant. It's very kind of difficult to work that out, right? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, anyway, it's cross-sectional data, so uh, I mean, you can't really draw conclusions anyway. Even if you could, I mean, you, we have to show this longitudinally. That, that's that's I mean, that's the only way you can argue for causal effects, and, and I'm, I'm working on that. So, uh, uh, so I'm every every. The uh, religious studies department it has a Buddhist meditation course where they teach meditation in the labs, and I've been able to uh, take measurements every two weeks using using the self-report measures I've developed. And so I have um, for for some students I have six measurements, and, I, and I've also done this like as a control sample. I've done this with the uh, participant pool also. So I have um, six. I, well, I will have six measurements from, from participant pool uh, students longitudinally, and then, then we can apply some of the continuous time modeling to that data. Yeah, I'm a little worried about the 95% confidence interval on a statistic that is being, you know, as I view it left to right or right to left, you know, I'm accumulating multiple tests. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. Um, I mean, just think of it as descriptive. Yeah. 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 And, and um, uh, all see, I, I've uh, all of these plots look similar, but I've I've measured other things too that, that look very different. Mm -hmm. So, um, if I included those other plots, then I could show you, oh, this this is more associated with training and not associated with uh, mental silence. Um, but I, um, I just, I don't have it on, on a slide. That's an interesting way of showing this, it's just a graphical part, where we wouldn't believe in the leftmost point, because we have too many people who actually don't uh, have any ties, and we don't believe in the rightmost point, because we have not enough participants. Right. So probably, yeah. Do <laughs> you want right to have another balance. slide that just says, ignore this part? <laughs> yeah. Maybe there should be a way of computing the uh, null distribution of that, uh, but nothing else than by simulation. Mm -hmm. um, it's, you know, it's, uh, even if it's just correlation, that's of course true, but uh, correlation is already a big part of the, the story. So yeah, it seems like maybe some sort of bootstrap could help here somehow. Um, you know, multiple sample size bootstraps. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, well, that's allowed, you can put a similar. You can just say, assume there is no uh, interaction with the or the C mastery. Um, mm -hmm. All the, the blue and the red curves in there. And then we'll also get something which is close to zero left and right, but may vary in the middle. Mm -hmm. uh, sure. Mm -hmm. It also seems to me that some of these things are. Like should be a curve in your relationship with like overall well-being. Like mental silence may be a good thing up to a point, right? Mm -hmm. Like how much.
much is too much mental silence when the music get to be bad. Like when you were describing the question, even for autonomy, I was like, is that a good thing? You know, if I completely ignore all available information and have my own play with opinion of myself, disregarding information from everyone else, is that is that so awesome? Um, and I think that pertains to some of the aspects of meditation and flow as well. Like how much spontaneity is really a good amount. Um, does it have a curability or relationship with the being? Is there a bad amount? Um, and similarly to that, with all the different facets of these ties that you've listed, you know, people may have relative strengths and weaknesses that would define their unique characteristics within that. You know, um, yeah. So I might, I, yeah, I might be amazing at mental silence and maybe not so spontaneous, for example. Mm -hmm. Or I might, you know, the, the profiles within ties might be really yeah. very interesting to see because right now we're just you're just trying to define it. That eventually, that would be if those are really key features. I'm saying I'm not doubting that they aren't, but. You know, seeing how people vary in profiles on that, and what it means to vary in profiles on those would be very interesting. You got a lot of work in you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But exciting. It's interesting stuff. Yeah. The, the um, one thing that one place where you might find it's harder than you think uh, um, is that uh, uh, um, some. Functions like sense of time have been resistant to localization um, and you know are hypothesized to be uh, um, a whole set of um, uh, regions linked together through a thalamic loop um, and and you know it's almost your whole brain that's participating by the time you. you, you localize it and so that's not so local <laughs> sure um, so finding where it is might not might not always come out positive mm -hmm. True. Uh, yeah. so like knockouts or yeah. uh, you know or studies of lesions lesion studies might help you a lot though for some of this yeah yeah I uh, you're saying that the timelessness is not very well localized in, in and that anatomically in our brain, and, and uh, yeah, that, that's my impression too, looking at the research. But uh, uh, I believe it's localized more or less to the neocortex. The, the thing that's interesting though about timelessness is that you can knock out lots of different parts uh, and they all, you know, uh, interfere with your sense of time. Okay. So it's yeah. like if you, you know, if you study, do lesion studies, you say, oh, it's that area. Oh, but it's also this area. Oh, but it's also this area. Okay, right. And uh, whereas, you know, and then the, and then, to my knowledge, the fMRI studies have not been particularly, uh, you know, helpful. But it's, it's, you get lots of, again, lots of different uh, localizations and not much agreement between studies. We need someone with a timelessness disorder. <laughs> All they have is that everything is perfectly normal about them, but they have All no they sense of time. <laughs> but I'm hoping to defer it as long as Yeah, you don't function very well without pelvis. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.